Hello and welcome to radio. I'm your host, Ray Weaver. And I'm still coming to you remotely from my parents' home, my old home in Pasadena, Maryland, while we close up the old house, sell things, move things around after my mom passing away in September. It's been hard work, lonely work. And, um, Brings up a lot of memories. I spent a lot of time last week when the weather was good and temperatures did that Maryland thing where they shot up to 60 degrees for a couple of days before plummeting down to 12 degrees at night and snow. We like to say that Maryland is the kind of place where you can experience all four seasons in one day. And that's pretty much what happened. But I was outside and I was tearing down my mom's old swimming pool, our old swimming pool. And, um, I don't know why I always call this my mom's house now. It was our house. I think I called it my mom's house because she was the last of my parents to live here, the last of us to live here. Of course, we had all moved away. So when we went home, we were all go- always going to mom's. Anyway, I'm tearing the swimming pool down and <laughs> you discover that, you know, my father had built a wooden deck around uh, this above ground swimming pool which they tell me, I don't know much about these things, but they tell me having an above ground swimming pool will lower the value of the property. So I'm taking it down and taking down the old wooden deck. And it's probably a good thing that the swimming pool didn't get used for a couple of years here in the last two, three years, because that thing is just rotted out, rotted out the support beam. I mean, it's like very little work to tear it down because it comes down almost when you yank on it. So, you know, and it, but it just so many memories from that place, so many memories from that pool where we sat out there as kids and, and teenagers and floated around in the pool and drank iced tea and ate potato chips and pretzels. And mom would bring out sandwiches on paper plates and, just so many memories and now it's just like this old rotten deck and the indoor outdoor carpet is all faded and ripped up and it just seems so permanent to tear it down but it has to be done like a lot of things here have to be done i have to take so much stuff to wherever i'm going to take it some of it just going to wind up in a dumpster somewhere some of it's just going to wind up tossed out A lot of it's going to the church, going up to the thrift store at the church. Mom's clothes, some of my old clothes, boots, books, lots of books, records, CDs, cassettes, 8-track tapes, although who the hell is going to want those? I don't know, 8-track tapes. But um, that's all going that way. And again, I'm just rambling. Remember that this show has no script. I just talk off the top of my head. And when I go up to the church... I just remember, this is uh, the United Methodist Church, a couple of miles from my house, at least like less than a mile, maybe a half a mile from my grandparents' place. And um, it's where I went to church as a boy. It's where I went to Sunday school. And uh, it's where I went to MYF, Methodist Youth Fellowship, in the evenings when I got a little older. It was one of my first places that I actually played my guitar and, and sang for people poorly uh, but there were a couple of other folks there and we we played folk songs and sang and it was as wholesome as it sounds it was really that of course you know there was sneaking out the door when we got a little older and going out to the bushes so I could steal a kiss with uh, one of the girls or you know maybe not me I didn't smoke but somebody might have smoked a cigarette or two out there And we were all in the youth choir together, so we would get ourselves to practice, to youth choir practice during the week, and then sing as the youth choir every Sunday before the, you know, adult choir sang. And we were all so cute in our little white half robes with a seasonal ribbon on it, you know, at springtime it was green, Christmas time it was red. And uh, according to the church calendar, it might have a different color. We sang Jesus Loves Me in Silent Night. And it was all so community-based. And 
my parents would come occasionally when I was singing in the choir. My parents would come when we were there singing. But my dad and mom were not <clears throat> what I would call regular churchgoers. And certainly, even though there was an adult Sunday school, my parents did not attend adult Sunday school. They, they parked uh, on the road outside of the church, which happened to be the access road to a brand new elementary school. And they would wait for us out there. Dad would wait for us, especially he was not going to come to church, you know. I mean, it wasn't anything against church. He just was not the kind of guy to sit for an hour and listen to religious stuff. God, he believed in God. He believed in Jesus. He believed in us going. One of the things that's sitting here in front of me right now is my Bible that I got when I was confirmed into the church as a member of the church by Reverend Bohai. And uh, August 30th, 1964. August 30th, 1964. So I have that here and um, in front of me. I don't know. There's a There are flowers pressed in here. I'm guessing maybe they came from when my sister died. There is one of those little funeral notices that you, you get when someone passes away. It talks about my sister passing away on October 10th, 1976. And the picture of Jesus with the Lord's Prayer on the back. And it's just religion was religion was part of our life. We went to church. We went to Sunday school. We spent a lot of time at the church because that's where a lot of social things went on. As I said, the youth fellowship, choir. But we weren't overly religious. It was just something that informed our lives, but didn't take over our lives. My parents both cursed with gusto. And I mean, they smoked. My dad enjoyed a beer. Uh, on the weekends, several beers every once in a while. And we had Christmas and we had Easter and we followed all of those Christian holidays. But it was just that it was sort of part and parcel of your everyday, you know. You went to work, you went to school, you went to church. It didn't seem to have the heavy quality that so much of religion has these days. It was just kind of a moral center. We loved the songs. We sang the songs. I loved Jesus Loves the Little Children. I love that song. I loved the inclusion in that song. And, you know, I grew up to be not particularly religious. And I don't know why. I don't know why. I think part of it was while I was going to that little church there with Reverend Bohai, a gentle reverend, nice man. After he retired, uh, a new guard took over, which was a little bit more evangelical in style, a little bit more finger pointing, a little bit more, in my mind, divisive. And I was older then, and it just kind of lost its charm to me. There was no charm left. There was a lot of anger. But anyway, that it, it was the church. It's where we went, and now I the building across the street is where they have the thrift store, which is right next to the cemetery where a lot of my people are buried, my grandfather and my grandmother, a couple of aunts and uncles. So this little enclave here, like a lot of those little country rural things, had a lot to do with my family. So the memories of of cleaning this house out. Don't just stop here at this building. It's the whole neighborhood. The little building behind where the thrift store is, which is now a police station annex, was the original Jacobsville Elementary School where my dad attended. And I wound up going there. One of the ironies of, of my life in this area is that my parents, when, when we were young, babies. My parents didn't have a lot of money, didn't have a lot of money. My dad was a carpenter, Jack Lake carpenter, trying to make it in that business. And uh, they just they had three kids in three years right after they got married. And so money was tight. And we lived in a series of rental homes and apartments that were probably, I mean, there's one of them that's sitting here still around, and I don't know how we lived in it. It's about the size 
of a relatively large prison cell, maybe. And <laughs> they had three kids in there. I don't even remember exactly how the rooms were structured, but there couldn't have been a lot of room in there. And the building's derelict now. It was derelict then. And But we lived there. That was one of our apartments. And there were a succession of apartments here and there and everywhere around, like a lot of young people in those days and still today. But my mom... My mom was insistent that by the time I went to school, we would have a home. We would have a permanent address. So I could go to the same school every every day, every year. She wasn't going to have me moving around, doing one year in a city school, one year in a county school, one year in another school. She wanted me to be in the same school. So my parents struggled and put the money together somehow to buy this house. And back when they bought this house in the early 60s, they paid $12,000 for it, $12,000. We found the deed the other day when we were going through all the property stuff and $12,000 for the house and the land. Incredible. And we moved here. My grandfather, my dad's father, told him he was a fool. He said, oh, you're a fool. You'll never be able to afford that house. You'll never make those payments. Well, my family has been here for over 60 years now. So, and my mother's family was here before then. So he did it. My dad pulled it off. My mom pulled it off. And it was home. For many, many years, it's the only place that I've ever called home. It took a while for me to, to let that notion go in my head that this would be the only home that I would ever have. And I love this old joint. We moved here, my mom, my dad, and my three sisters. We were, my sisters, the girls were five, four, and three. I was five, Sandy was four, Tammy was three, roughly in that, in that area. And um, we had no furniture in here, very little. There was a kitchen table some chairs, and there was no furniture because we couldn't afford it. So pieces came along, piecemeal from, you know, stuff people were getting rid of and generosity and stuff. And we had some beds, of course, but there was <laughs> there were certainly no creature comforts. But it wasn't all that bad in a way because we had a few toys and a few uh, board games and cards. And so we we made it. We made it. We had family nights and we got a black and white television. And then we got a color TV moving on, but we had a black and white television with the rabbit ears and tin foil, and you could pick up the three Baltimore stations if you were lucky, and then occasionally you could get Channel 5 out of D.C. We didn't know what UHF was yet, but we could watch a little bit of TV. And we moved in here because... We needed a home so I could go to school and go to the same school. And the irony of that is because of the way the neighborhood was changing, because of the way the it was growing and people were moving down here and, and they were building new schools and tearing down stuff. I never went one year to the same school in elementary school. The first year I went to Lakeshore Elementary, which is where I was supposed to go. Uh, that was, we lived near Lakeshore. That was my school, but that was overcrowded. So the next year they sent a certain number of us that lived in a certain zip code over to the Jacobsville, the old Jacobsville Annex, which is where my dad went to school. It was a tiny, almost virtually one-room schoolhouse set up with about four or five one-rooms in it. I wound up going to second grade there. The third grade, I went in the basement of a church. I went in the basement of a church. Downstairs, our class our, was because they were building new schools and they just kept on moving us around the fourth grade. I actually went to the brand new Northeast Senior High School that I would eventually graduate from. I went fourth grade in 
a high school with all the other high school classes going on around us and us seeing high schoolers. And now remember, by this time, we're moving well into Beatle times and moving well into rock and roll times. So I'm seeing like these cool guys and beautiful girls that look like they're off movie screens while I'm a fourth grader. And yeah, I think it might have had some some effect on on my mind and, and how I saw the world, seeing all these kids in their cars and stuff, 16, 17 years old, and here I'm in the fourth grade. The fifth grade, I finally went to the brand new Jacobsville Elementary, and I also went to sixth grade there. So I had two years in a row at the same school, which was my mother's number one desire. And then I was off to what we used to call junior high school and had a couple of years there. And, but instead of the three years that traditionally up until that point, you had a junior high school, I had two years there. And then I went in the ninth grade, I went to high school. And that was always the same Northeast Senior High. It's just a sweet irony to the fact that uh, I never had that thing that my mom wanted where I'd always go to the same school and have the same teachers and be around the same people because they just kept moving us around like cattle. But that was the neighborhood. It was changing. It was growing. Uh, times were just completely... It was an amazing time, in my mind, to grow up in, in the U.S. I mean, there was a lot of tragedy, of course. The assassinations of President Kennedy and his brother, Martin Luther King. There was just that, Vietnam, all of it. It was tragic. It was on the news. You could see it. But then again, there were the Beatles, and the Rolling Stones, and the Who, and the Dave Clark Five, and the Herman's Hermits, and the joy of this incredibly vivacious and happy music. It was like all of a sudden the world was turning on color. Color TVs were, of course, coming around big time. I think we eventually got one too later on, but we got one. But it just seemed so much brighter then richer, the clothes were cool and colorful, the music was cool and colorful, and the products were designed to appeal to young people, the Mustang, the hope, the sense of possibility was very real. I mean, everything was still right out in front of me, and everyone I knew was still alive, and I had friends that you know, we all had the same passion, the same dream, maybe not the same exact dream, but it was just, yeah, you know, you can do stuff. I hadn't lost any friends yet. I, no, no one in my age group had died yet. That happened when I was my first year of high school. My friend, uh, John McIsaac, so you have to understand something. I was a nerd. I mean, I, I was like the nerdiest nerd of nerds. The only thing that rescued me from pure, you know, wallflower existence where no one knew my name was the fact that um, I played the guitar and sang a little bit. That was it. And so I sort of hung around with other bright, nerdy, probably not particularly attractive people and John McIsaac was the smartest guy in school. John was just smart. He was smarter than me, smarter than anybody. And he was, may he rest in peace, the living, breathing caricature of the smartest guy in school. Nerdy, small, thick glasses, buck teeth. But he was funny, smart. We watched Star Trek and talked about it. And we had that nerd thing going on together. And John died. He drowned in between school years. He was there one school year. I came back the next year after summer. He wasn't there because he drowned. He had been out swimming with a bunch of friends, family, crowded beach here in the area. And I heard that he went down one of the sliding boards, hit his head, and People didn't realize he was gone for quite some time. And I know it, maybe it seems a little strange that, you know, I didn't, I knew that he had passed away, but we didn't have a lot of contact over the summer. We were school friends. He lived in a different neighborhood than me, even though we went to the same school. And we weren't as connected in those days. Remember, we weren't constantly in each other's faces on the internet and on phones and stuff. You could call people and talk to them, sure, but 
you had your school friends. Sometimes they blended with your other friends, your neighborhood friends, but oftentimes they didn't. Oftentimes you had the kids in the neighborhood that you hung out with, and then you had, you know, folks you went to school with, and you were friends when you went to school. Maybe your parents would drive you over, or you'd do homework together, or whatever, sometimes. But John was a school friend. So, I mean, I really first noticed his absence in my life when I went back to school. And that was the first brush I'd had with someone in my immediate generation dying that I knew. And there were actually people, you know, people can be cruel. People, Kids especially can be cruel. And they're actually jockey types and, you know, jock types and hard asses that said, hey, Weaver, where's McIsaac? You know, they would tease me about it. I, I never, it never upset me that they could visibly see. I mean, I knew what a jerk was then. And I still know what a jerk is. And they were just being jerks. But, man, that's the first time I have thought about John McIsaac. And I do not know how many years. But that was my first brush with someone in my generation dying. We were young then. But because we were the generation we were, because we were maybe a little wilder, a little more free, and testing a lot of boundaries. And because of Vietnam, some of the older boys, some of the guys ahead of me were dying. And I was aware of that because I had friends in the neighborhood that had older brothers that went to Vietnam. And they talked about that. And they talked about losing friends. But in my own specific generation, it became more common, I guess, later on, because I started losing friends to automobile accidents, car accidents. The coolest guy that I ever went to school with in my life, the coolest guy that I've ever known in my life was named Danny. Danny was just that guy in school that a certain group of kids and girls and young boys look up to. He was just so self-assured. Great looking guy, tall. He was able to walk that thin line that very few people walk in high school of being big enough and strong enough to play football and to be on the football team and be part of that crowd and still be an artist. He was an amazing artist, an artistic guy and hung around in art class. And he was also nice, nice always well-dressed, you know, and, and fashionable. He was always turning me on to cool music. He was always saying, you know, Weaver, that stuff you're listening to, man. Yeah, you know, whatever you just, no, man, no, come on. You got to listen to this. And he would turn me to, on to things that my uh, somewhat bubblegumish ears were not quite ready to hear. But he was always trying to get me to listen to the cool stuff. And so... When I finally started a little band, my little three-piece band actually practiced down in, in his neighborhood. Now, our neighborhood where we are was not exactly upscale. It wasn't poor, but it was definitely blue collar, lower middle class. Over where Danny lived, the kids that I, I hung out with over there, they came from families with a little bit more cash. Bigger homes, it was across the water. The bigger homes, you know, dads had probably white collar jobs that, that you needed a tie to go to. A lot of them had moved into the area. A lot of them weren't from here like we were. Danny and his family was from somewhere, Midwest somewhere. I can't remember exactly where. I'm sure it'll come to maybe Illinois. And um, they were just different while being almost exactly the same. But they were just different. They had a different feel a different vibe. I started hanging over there a lot because I liked the area for one thing. And I had a girlfriend from over there, which was like almost unheard of. It's not quite a Romeo and Juliet kind of thing, but for a guy from my neighborhood to have a girlfriend from that neighborhood, it was pretty unprecedented. And it was all because of the damn guitar. It really was. 
Marlene wasn't interested in me because I was any kind of good looking or any kind of charming or anything else at that point. She liked the fact that I was in that little terrible three-piece Grand Funk Railroad imitating band. But these were my friends, Manny and his brother John, David, the guy who played drums for me, John Clark, the bass player. Marlene was my girlfriend, her sister, Kathy. There was another Kathy over there as well. These were my summer night friends. These were after band practice, sitting outside, drinking some beers that we weren't supposed to be drinking, smoking cigarettes. Well, they were. I never got that habit. I think I mentioned that. I think I came downstairs from too many parties that my parents had had the night before or get together as a holiday stuff. And I'd come downstairs as a kid and there'd be cigarettes or but cigarette butts floating around in glasses of beer. It's like, ah, it just didn't appeal to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And also, now remember, here we are, we're in the mid 60s, early mid 60s. All of a sudden, we're hearing about how dangerous these things are. And the Surgeon General is saying that this stuff is not good for you. And as I mentioned, I was a nerd. So if I was learning something in school, if I was getting little pamphlets in school about the dangers of smoking and the teachers were saying it was terrible and you shouldn't do it, I'm listening, man. I didn't know that they were going back to the teacher's lounge and lighting up. I didn't know that they were just like handing out stuff because they were told to hand it out. I just took it seriously. So these were my folks, my, my, the people that I hung with. And again, all of those relationships, those teenage relationships, are close one minute, transient the next. Close one minute, transient the next. So one night, I was uh, at the drive-in. I had taken a girl to the drive-in. Now, the girl at one time had been one of Dan's girlfriends, and she wasn't Dan's girlfriend anymore, and you could not not date the girls that had been Dan's girlfriends at one time or another because there would never be another available girl because every girl that we knew had been Dan's girlfriend at one time or another. So I was out with her. Her name is Kathy. And we were at the drive-in. I had moved up a little bit in the social scale at that point because I had gotten a little taller. I wasn't quite so goofy looking. I mean, there wasn't a lot of improvement. I was still about five, nine, ten, maybe weighed 120 pounds if I was lucky. My hair looked like a Brillo pad and my face... Well, I was a teenager, but she liked me and I liked her. So we went to the drive-in, which is what you did around here. We went to the drive-in to see something I don't remember. And the movie wasn't really the point anyway, it was being together. Now, this is really hard for people to understand, I think, that live in the world that we live in now and never lived in the world that I lived in or some of you lived in. There was no instant communication. When you were on a date with a girl somewhere, when you were out somewhere, there was no way for anyone to find you. There was no cell phone. There was no, oh, let's call him or text him or whatever. When you were away from people, you were away from people. There was no finding us. And we needed to be found because... We had gone on our date. We were headed back to the neighborhood. And as we headed back down the road to the neighborhood, there was a car accident. We saw the car accident. And there were emergency vehicles and people and police and and of course, we couldn't uh, stop. They wouldn't let us stop. But we knew because it was Danny's car. Danny had hit a tree. And a lot of our pals had been in that car with him. And Danny had hit that tree really hard. The front end of the car was gone. I found out later on that the engine of the car was literally almost in the back seat. My girlfriend and her sister were also in the back seat. Yeah, I was out with another girl that night. I was a teenager. But my girlfriend 
and her sister were in the back seat and Danny was in the front seat. Some Another guy was in the front seat. I can't remember who he was, just another part of the gang. My girlfriend and her sister were injured. Not seriously, but seriously enough. I think my girlfriend's sister, Corinne, had a broken leg, pretty seriously broken leg. My girlfriend banged up, tossed around. I don't remember what happened to the other guy, much to my discredit, but Danny was dead. My best friend, my hero, my, um, the guy that I admired the most, role model, I guess is the word, was dead. He did a tree with his car. And in our little world, there's no way to diminish what a tragedy that was. Because it was the end of so much. He was the, kind of the focal point. He was kind of the, guy that, you know, to somehow or another held the whole thing together. And when he died, went to the funeral, went back to his house and saw his parents, whom I didn't really see much before that. You know, we, kids in those days, we lived a, if they had a split level house, we were in the bottom level and the parents were on the top level. You saw them when they brought down Cokes or pizza or whatever, but didn't interact with parents like kids interacted with parents when I had my own kids and stuff. You just They just weren't around. They were there, but they weren't hovering over you and they weren't watching over you. They were just there. But he was gone. And a lot of things started to unravel then. I broke up with my girlfriend. The band broke up. I stopped going to the neighborhood. It just, you know, it just seemed like somehow or another something irreplaceable had been lost. And what we were, what connected us in that environment was gone. And the whole thing just sort of fell apart. Not right away, not right away. But it definitely was a change. It was the first experience in my life of an actual death of someone that I knew and knew well. And a year later, maybe two years later, Dan's brother, John, little brother, John, who was a couple of years younger than Dan, wound up piling his car into the same exact tree. You can make out of that what you will and yeah, it was probably that. So, you know, we were wild. And I've told the story before about losing my sister. My sister was the craziest one of us. <laughs> my sister, Sandy, my middle sister. She was... Uh, Wilder than me. Sandy was not a nerd. Sandy was one of the cool chicks. Much to my eternal annoyance, my friends found her very attractive, and she was a very attractive girl. And I remember when we lost her. She and her boyfriend, Lyle, were going to get married. And they hadn't officially set a date, but it was bound to happen. Everybody knew it. My folks were resigned to the idea. Sandy was just about 18, so if they tried to stop her, she would just wait a few months and go get hitched up anyway, right? And she had a mind of her own, and she had my dad wrapped around her little finger, <laughs> I think from the day she was born. That black hair and blue eyes, and he was hers, man. You know. And the years went on, as I said, she had the effect on pretty much every boy that came in contact with her. Deep down, I I think I, I know how beautiful she was. But to me, she was just an annoying little sister. Actually, thinking back on it, as far as my sister's boyfriends went, I thought old Lyle was okay. Now, to be charitable, Lyle was not exactly what you would call a heartbreaker. He was a little older than Sandy. My dad said he was too old. 
He was skinny. He had, he had big black horn rim glasses. He was completely different. And yet, in an odd way, exactly the same as all of Sandy's boyfriends. My dad took one look at him and shook his head and said, ah, she's brought home another stray. We were all constantly amazed that his beautiful daughter had such a knack for collecting driftwood when it came to men. She seemed totally oblivious to the, you know, high school football stars and pretty boys that would have just given their eye teeth for one date. And she took up with guys that most of her friends would not have touched with a clothes pole, to use a phrase common in the day. Lyle, to me, was a step up. I liked Lyle. He could at least have a conversation um, that consisted of more than two words, which is more than I could say for most of Sandy's boyfriends, especially her ex-boyfriend, Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy could not manage much more than a Sandy there when he called on the phone. When he visited the house, he smelled of oil and gasoline, cigarette smoke from the garage where he worked. That is if he even bothered to come in the house. I'm thinking about it. Mostly he just blew his horn and waited for Sandy out in the driveway. And my dad would sit there and look at her, say, he needs to come in. And she, Sandy would like, he's just shy, daddy. He's just shy. And she would kiss him on the cheek and run out the door. The girl owned my dad, lock, stock, and barrel. Sandy and Jimmy, they'd been sweethearts all through high school and our family, you know, typical sweetheart, high school stuff. How many, God only knows how many tearful breakups and joyful reconciliations, and we'd hear raised voices and Jimmy tearing off in his Ford or whatever piece of junk he was driving that night, and then wait for the phone calls to start. 10 calls, 20 calls, 30 calls. Finally, Dad would make her take the damn phone, and Jimmy would apologize, and she'd take him back, and it was all pretty nauseating. <laughs> I really could not figure out what she saw in the guy. And I, being the nasty big brother that I was, I let her know it. So how did we get from Sandy and Jimmy to S Sandy and Lyle and wedding bells, you know? As I remember, and it's a long time ago, it's a long time ago, Lyle started stopping in every morning at the little bakery where Sandy worked. And after <laughs> buying probably 10 dozen donuts and accepting at least as many rejections, he finally caught her in the middle of one of her breakups with Jimmy and Sandy went out with Lyle and wonder of wonders, she kept going out with Lyle. It really seemed like she and Jimmy were finished for good. And she started to keep a hope chest. You guys remember a hope chest? Do they still do hope chests? I don't know. You know, a little wooden like box thing that she would put stuff in. Flatware, dish towels, blankets, her hope chests for when she got married. Of course, you know, me being who I am, I was like, you're going to need a much bigger hope chest than that one as long as you'll be hoping for somebody to marry you. And uh, Sandy could give it as well as I could give it. She's like, yeah, well, if I get married, I'll have you dance at my wedding. And that stung because I can't dance. I'm petrified of dancing. I didn't even go to my senior prom because I didn't want to dance. And uh, she knew that. I don't know what happened then. I, I don't know what happened. Maybe she just figured she owed Jimmy a decent goodbye. Or maybe he just wore her down by constantly calling her at work and at the house. Either way, she agreed to go out and meet with him one more time. She said, just one more time. Says to me, 
If Lyle calls, please don't tell him where I'm at, okay? I remember telling her, look, don't drag me into this, Sandy. Why are you messing around with Jimmy anyway? Lyle's a good guy. She's like, I'm not messing around with anybody. We're going for a ride. I know you don't like him, but he's got a good heart. And we were together for a long time. I think I owe him that much. That was my sister, Sandy. All heart. Sandy and her strays. The cop told my dad, Jimmy's car hit the overpass doing at least 90. All of the typical small town rumors flew, you know, alcohol, anger, drugs. None of it mattered then and none of it matters now. My sister and Jimmy were gone and there wasn't going to be a wedding to Lyle or Jimmy or anyone. Ever. In Sandy's hope chest, I found a Kodak envelope filled with pictures of she and Lyle in Florida. Apparently she had asked dad and dad had refused to give her permission to go. So she'd use the story of spending a weekend with her girlfriend, Diane, to sneak away. My mom knew. I think moms always know, man. She smiled so sadly at the images of her lost little girl wearing Mickey Mouse ears and giant plastic sunglasses and said she told us that she was at Diane's that weekend, but she came home crying and said she was going to break up with Lyle. Mom said when she asked her why, she just said, Mommy's not as nice as he looks. Sometimes I just miss Jimmy. I never saw Lyle again after my sister's funeral. I never had a chance to ask him what my sister meant by that. I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know. Maybe all of that stuff in her hope chest was for the life she wanted to have with Jimmy after all. Maybe in her heart of hearts, he was always going to be the one she was hoping for. I remember so well, Sandy saying to me once, Jimmy would be great if he would just grow up a little. Well, Jimmy never had to grow up. And neither did Sandy. Forever 17 years old, both of them. 17 years old. It was a long time ago. Long time ago. Most days I have forgiven Jimmy for taking my sister away from me. And on most days I have forgiven my sister for choosing such lousy boyfriends. And robbing herself, robbing all of us of the rest of her life. But she was a good kid. She deserved better. She deserved the thing that she wanted the most, a good man and a house full of kids of her own. I guess I want to hold on to that belief that we'll, that she has all of that somewhere and we'll all get to be together somewhere and maybe there is that place where all things possible and I'll get to dance at her wedding. I don't know about that kind of stuff. Like I said... We were raised to believe that those things were possible. And I'm here in this old house where so many of those possibilities were, were part of my life. And I've gone by the old church where Sandy would have probably gotten married and it just didn't happen. And you know, losing those people in that generation that is yours, I don't think any of us can go through that and, and not start to have a sense of our own mortality. My other sisters and I vary between being very close and being very distant from one another. We have adult relationships and they have their ups and downs, but this is a family, this is a place, this is a environment that was built on that old fashioned love. It could be intense, it could be very, very fiery, and it could be very, very cold. We are, we're not a leave it to beaver family. 
even though we watched that stuff. We're not Andy of Mayberry, even though we watched that. We had those wishes, I think, those values, but we were not those people. My mom did not walk around wearing pearls and high heels, and my dad was a blue-collar man, wore a shirt with his name on it pretty much his whole life. Came home from work, smelling of oil and work and sweat. So wasn't that kind of beaver, cleaver kind of, oh, I have to tell you this thing about beaver. I just got to thinking about beaver. One time, okay, I'm like, I don't know, really young, six, seven, eight, maybe. I know I was in school because I was off school because I was sick. I had a really high fever. I was sick. I had a flu or something. Who knows what you call things these days? Let's not even go down that road yet. But um, I had a flu, some sort of childhood thing going on. So mom kept me home from school. And um, I had a really high fever, really high fever. And I don't know why I remember this. I have no idea why. I will tell you that it's kind of odd. Like I say, I tell these stories off the top of my head and I have this incredibly weird ability to remember things that happened to me when I was very young. Before most of the people that are supposed to know about this kind of stuff say that you should be able to, I can remember things from when I was very, very young. And we'll talk more about that going on. So I'm home from school. I'm lying on the couch and I'm watching reruns, I guess, of Leave it to Beaver during the day. Had a very high fever and mom was, you know, puttering around the house, doing what moms do, keeping one eye and one ear on me and bringing me stuff and water or soup or whatever. And I said to her, mom, you need to bring me some oranges. And she's like, I don't know that we have any oranges, Ray. Why do you need oranges? I said, well, Beaver wants oranges. And I, I want to give him some oranges. Apparently, in my fever estate, I was having some sort of beaver dream, beaver whatever, that um, Jerry Mathers, as the beaver, was in my living room with me, and we were going to sit and eat oranges together. I don't quite recall how my mom handled that, but I think it probably involved a cold compress and a couple of more baby aspirin. And uh, Beaver and I never did get to have those oranges. More is the pity. But that was just, you know, mom was there and it was okay, even though I was not feeling well. It was okay. And I miss my mom. I was very close to my mom up and down throughout my whole life. We had our moments, we really did, of arguing and being sideways with one another. But the love was deep and the love was great. And so much of what I do, so much of who I am, these stories, the songs, the music, it comes from my mother. My dad was a taciturn man, not particularly musical, although he, he did try a few times to entertain us um, with his musical ability, although he had none. We were uh, staying up. My, my uh, cousin Kenny and I had gotten the unenviable job of staying home with the two sisters while my parents went out on New Year's Eve one time. And again, early teen years, maybe 12, 13, they go out and ask Kenny and I to stay home with the girls. And uh, so we did, you know, we, we, you know, we do what parents ask you to do in those days. Do you did? Well, parents didn't really ask you to do anything. Let's, let's, let's quantify. Parents told you what the hell you were going to do and you did it. And my parents told me I was going to stay home with my sisters and watched them while they went out for New Year's Eve and said I could have Kenny over with me. And that's how that went down. They didn't ask me anything. So we stayed home and watched Dick Clark probably dropping the ball from Times Square and, and uh, probably snatched a purloined National Bohemian beer from somewhere. And... That was our big New Year's Eve, you know. We fell asleep, 
I think we all fell asleep in the living room because that's where we all were. So my parents come in and uh, it was six o'clock in the morning. And I know this because my dad started beating on the piano, old upright piano we had in the living room that was never in tune anyway. He starts beating on it singing, it's six o'clock in the morning, it's six o'clock in the morning, it's six o'clock in the morning, wake up, wake up, wake up. Now, that's how I knew it was six o'clock in the morning. Dad did not seem to care that those of us that were being entertained by this concert um, were not particularly entertained. We let him know that he could not sing and he was not able to play the piano. But, you know, it was six o'clock in the morning. He was fresh in from New Year's Eve and by gosh, he was going to give us a concert and he did. And uh, it was short and not at all sweet. Just the things that happened as you walk around this house, the ghosts, the good ones and the bad ones, and you don't know this because of the miracles of modern recording, but it's really cold here right now. It's really cold. It's been down as low as you know, 12, 10 Fahrenheit here. This is Chesapeake Bay cold, man. This is when that nice, damp coldness hangs in the air. And you can see it. So it soaks through into your bones. And because we're getting the house ready to sell, we don't have a lot of amenities here. I'm using space heaters. So what you can see is that as I do this broadcast, this podcast, I have to get up every now and then and stop, turn the space heaters and everything back on, let them run for a while because it's cold as hell. And I don't, but I don't want all those fans and stuff running while I'm trying to do the show. So a lot of times when I'm doing the show, it's cold in here, man, but it's worth doing. I really, you know, I appreciate the fact that you listen to me tell these stories because I don't know really what benefit it has to anybody but me. It helps me work it out in my head. It helps me say goodbye. It helps me say goodbye, but not throw anything away. So much stuff has been thrown away. Papers, and shoes, and boots, and years and years and years of magazines and it's all been recycled or thrown away but i don't want to throw away these memories i don't want them to go away if i have a regret with my parents it's that i didn't record them enough i didn't record their voices enough their faces their you know movies and stuff of course we had all of the stuff to be able to do that kind of thing but funnily enough, with me being in this business and me doing this stuff for a living, it never really occurred to me to record my, my dad while he was still alive. I didn't realize it at the time that I was going to miss and start to forget the sound of his voice, that I was going to forget the sound of my dad's voice. I don't, I mean, I, I guess I remember it, I guess, but I don't know. I mean, and of course, all of this is about being here with their memories, my dad's memory and my mom's memory. And I have written so much stuff about my dad. But until now, mentions between my about my mom have been few and far between. So, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to get her in here now, I'm trying to make sure that she's part of these stories and you you get to know her as well because she was important. She was important in ways that I guess maybe I didn't even realize at the time. But again, I just wish I would have somehow or another, you know, can just had more physical pieces of her left, voice, movies, those kind of things. So... I'm doing this for them. I'm doing this for my kids. I'm doing it for myself. And hopefully you're getting something out of it as well. Thanks for listening. The show is called Radio. And I'm going to get back to the radio on the Small Town Radio Day soon. I promise you. And I promise, I promise you that the next time you hear from me, it'll be a little bit more uplifting than, than where I've been today. 
But this is radio. Don't forget to go to Amazon and check out my book and audio book of Father's Heart. Look around on the internet for my music. I'm terrible, terrible at this kind of stuff. So you can find all of my music for free. And um, I hope to see you again. If you like this, please let somebody know. If you're listening as a podcast, you know, let people know it's your favorite. Give it a review. Let people know that you like it. Tell people about it. If you're listening to it as a radio broadcast, tell whoever runs it for you that you heard it and you like it. And I'll see you next time.